souls together that are joined with the soul of, of, of your son, Jesus Christ, and the souls of one another, that we can be one family and one people here in Roanoke in the New River Valley, and in so doing, show you to the world. Lord, we love you. We pray all these things in Christ's holy name and the power of your Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Uh, before we open up the Bible, we're going to be in, in Philippians 2, uh, verses 1 through 11, by the way, this morning. So you can go over and turn there. But we're, before we read, I have a few statistics I want to share with you all this morning. Yeah, for those of you guys who studied, studied stats, that is. Uh, the past year, in this past year, 47% of young people have reported feeling anxiety or depression, the highest number ever surveyed. That's basically one in two, by the way. So if you go and look at young people out, out on the streets or in their homes or on the social medias, the Facebook, one in two reports being anxious and or depressed. This past year, 61% of all young adults reported they're experiencing serious loneliness. Serious loneliness. It's pretty sad. A number of years ago, a study came out uh, showing that the average American only has 16 acquaintances. I have like 4,000 Facebook friends, by the way. So the average American only has 16 acquaintances. And only three of which, by the way, like 2,500 of those are like from church, by the way. So anyways, average American, 16 acquaintances. This is the Barna Research Group, by the way. You can go and look up these statistics. Only three of which of those 16 acquaintances uh, do they think will actually remain their friends for life. And only another, uh, including those three, another two. So five total, the average American only has five total people that they're willing to hang out with one-on-one. -on -one that they feel comfortable enough with hanging out one-on-one. -on -one. And if you think about your spouse, that's like four other people, maybe. You know, like, <laughs> Americans are friendless and lonely. And these numbers are only decreasing. Those numbers I just quoted to you, uh, except for the depression statistics from this past year, those other numbers were from 2018 and prior. That was before the global pandemic. Wow! Those numbers are decreasing. Another study showed that the average American only makes friends with people that are exactly the same as them. And when I say the same, I'm talking 75% of Americans, their friends are only people who are the same ethnicity or racial background as them. 75%. Another, including that, another 60 to 70% of Americans all report that all of their friends are also the same as them in every other way. And, and when I say that, what I mean is socioeconomic status, life stage, relationship status, like uh, political uh, association, right? People make friends in America. People make friends with people who are exactly the same as them. And they don't have very many friends. These are sobering statistics. And so what does it mean to share life together? What does it mean to be of one mind? When we look at these statistics, and then we look at the word of God and we ask that question, oh man, it's hard to find the answer. And I was talking to someone the other day about friendships and how friendships are hard. And for many years, I, I've never felt like I had a best friend. Uh, and even today, the, da the data shows that people don't really make new friends. If you have three best friends, it's because you've had them since high school or middle school and you still live in the same place. People don't make new friends in America today. And so having best friends is hard. If you've had best friends, it's, it's the people that you grew up with or went to college with. And you might keep those friendships, but tend not to add new relationships. Now, growing up, I never really had best friends. And moving didn't really make that easier, right? Many of us, if you're like me, maybe you were hurt in friendships over the years as well. You know, I remember as a, as a kid, one of my uh, best friends in the neighborhood invited me over to his house. And this is, you know, back when we just walked, a, you know, a mile, two miles to people's houses. and That was normal, right? And uh, so I, I walk over to my friend's house and I, I get to his house and he has another friend over. And I'm like, oh, I guess the three of us are going to hang out together, right? And, uh, and then he, he greets me. He says, hi, bye. And I say, wait, what? I thought we were hanging out. Like you just, I just walked across the neighborhood. He's like, well, I guess you can go home now. You came over, didn't you? And I was like, 
You just call, you know, I got mad, right? I raised my voice. You know, almost angry crying, right? You just called me. I just walked across the neighborhood to hang out with you. You said you wanted me over here. And then he yelled back, just go home, you know? And so his dad comes out, right? Here's the commotion. His dad comes out and he's like, well, what's going on, boys? And I, and I tell him what happens and he says, well, sounds like you better walk home. He doesn't want to hang out with you. And so I walked the mile and a half home, like angry, seething, but like so embarrassed and ashamed and lonely, right? And like cry, yeah, I get home, I'm like crying, I'm like nine years old, right? And um, I think it was safe to say that on that day, me and my friend uh, did not share our souls with one another. Yeah. So <laughs> uh, the reality is that friendship is really hard. The reality is that life together, sharing our souls, is really hard. And struggling with friendships, if you're anything like me, sometimes you can feel like your needs aren't being met. Or that that relationship that you give so much of your heart to isn't reciprocal. Meaning that person doesn't care for you as much as you care for them. And things like that can hurt. The thing is, though, I've, I've been hurt in friendships but I've also hurt others in friendships. That's a cycle of sin in our world. You know, I've also let other friends down. Maybe I didn't invite a friend over and then tell him to walk home, but I did have another friend in the neighborhood who was maybe not as popular as everybody else, and, and I would hang out with him and be his friend. But then when it came, you know, when we went into middle school, guess who stopped hanging out with him? I did. I did, because he, he didn't fit in as much. We didn't get along as well. He, he was a little bit more awkward around others, and I betrayed him. I abandoned him. And the thing is, that sin in my heart with friendships, that hardening of heart towards others, that hasn't gone away. Maybe I don't like ignore someone because they're not cool enough anymore, but you best believe there's times where, where I don't respond to people because I feel like I don't have the emotional capacity in that moment to give to them. There's, there's times where I kind of put people at a distance because I just, it, it feels too hard to have to give my soul to them right now. So I don't know if you're anything like me, but I find relationships difficult. And I think about all, over the years how many times I've hurt others. Oh my goodness. Becoming more and more self-protective as I've been hurt hurting others even more, effectively hardening my heart towards both of them. Maybe I'm the only one who struggled with sharing my soul with others, but maybe some of you guys can relate. The title of the message this morning is Souls Together. And as we think about difficult relationships, have you ever felt lonely? Have you felt lonely this past year? Do you ever feel yourself, like feel the actual moments when you sin against someone else? And how maybe it hurts their soul, but it also hurts your soul. Do you ever find yourself maybe even hurting someone in this faith community, in this place where we're supposed to be one family? Or do you ever find yourself wondering why you don't have close relationships or why it's so difficult to have friendships in the church? Have you felt hurt by someone else? And have you, have you then secluded yourself? Do you feel as maybe if others have sinned against you? And I think these things are really real. This isn't a light topic, but I think the, the Lord has a word for us this morning on this very topic. As we seek to live life together and share our souls with one another, please stand with me and let's read the word of the Lord together. In Philippians 2, I'm reading in the ESV. We're going to start in verse 1 through 11. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit. But in humility, count others more significant than yourselves. Let each of us look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, 
who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You may take a seat. You know, as we read from the book of Philippians, Philippians may very well be known as Paul's letter of friendship. Of all of Paul's letters to the churches, Philippians carries the tone of the most joy and the most intimacy of all those letters. You know, if you read any of Paul's letters, like this is the one where he seems the happiest, right? He seems most uh, at ease with these relationships. And Paul speaks of the joy he has received from this friendship with the Philippians, this relationship that he has with them. And so he makes this request, that if we have any encouragement or comfort from the love of Jesus, and obviously we do, he says, if any koinonia of the Spirit, any common sharing, any life together in the Spirit of God, and obviously we do, then Paul requests that we make his joy complete. And how do we make Paul's joy complete? Well, he says, by being in and of one mind, full accord and one mind. The original language here in full accord literally means with one soul. It's sin suke, meaning one or, or together and souls. What he says when he says of one mind is literally be souls together. Be souls together. It's actually really similar to uh, the word that we get our English word from symphony. One voice is one sounds that comes from one soul. And we think about this sinsuke of life together, souls together, the rich harmony of all of our voices crying out as we worship. How beautiful that is. And that's this idea of souls together. Aristotle, a Greek philosopher, wrote, friends have one soul between them. Friends' goods are common goods, common property. Friendship is equality. If we want peace and justice in the world, we need to have friendship. You now, friendship is harder today than probably in every, any day prior. You now, likely because we are disconnected from the souls of others, but also our own souls. You know, this text in Philippians 2 is a call for us to have koinonia of the Spirit together, sharing of the Spirit together, to have one soul together. But what does it mean to share a soul? The soul was the New Testament word for our whole being, right? In the New Testament, the biblical authors speak about our minds, our bodies, our hearts. But when they speak about the soul, they're encapsulating all those things into one being. Dallas Willard puts it this way, the soul is the deepest and the most vital part of the person as a whole. That who are you as a person? You are a soul. And being souls together means we share the deepest and most vital bits of who we are with one another. This is the result of koinonia of the Spirit. Paul says, if any sharing of the Spirit with God himself, and in fact, this is only possible because of the sharing of the Spirit of God by God himself. This is only possible. If souls together, it's only possible because God found humanity worthy to pour his spirit onto all flesh. And when he pours his spirit onto all flesh, we can become partakers in the spirit of God, having fellowship with God himself in his spirit, but not alone, together. And when we are enabled to live together as one soul, Paul points us out that we share the spirit of God. And in his love, Christ demonstrates this for us too. He too shared his flesh with us as the Father shares the Spirit with us. In verses 6 through 11, 
And what we read here, these are probably not Paul's own words. In verse 6 through 11, you might recognize and realize that it sounds almost more like poetry, poetry or prose. Your Bible might even like change the way that the column is formatted, right, to show you this. But these words in verses 6 through 11 are, pro- are probably Paul quoting an early Christian hymn that the church is saying out together as one soul in the first century. And Paul is he's reminding them of the words and calling them back to be souls together and showing them the beauty of Christ's soul. Why I love verses 6 through 11 so much and why I think the early Christians love these verses so much because I think these verses are a beautiful depiction of Christ's soul himself. You know, Jesus, though God, freely chose to empty himself of his godness, thus taking on the form of a human person. And a human person at that that was born in a manger in the dirt, surrounded by animals. Christ, the God-man, made himself a slave of all people, humbling himself to the point of death, something a God should never experience. And in that death, Jesus took on the most humbling and painful death, nails being drilled through his hands and his legs, hanging naked and shameful on a cross. This is the person that Christ is as he shared humanity and his soul with us. And we're forced to ask the question, why? We're confronted with this text. Why would Christ do this? Why would a God-man die and die like this? And I believe the answer for Paul in this moment is because he knows that Jesus wants to be our friend. Jesus wants to be friends with us. He wants to share his soul with us. He wanted us to be joined together in friendship. And how was he to do this? By utterly humbling himself to the point of death on a cross. And notice I use plural language here, though. Notice I did not say, Jesus did this to be friends with you, singular. Jesus did this just to be friends with William. What's up, William? Or just to be friends with John. What's up, John? Um, No, but Jesus did this to be friends with all of us. Sometimes we get this, this idea, this individualistic Western idea in our heads that Jesus died for me as an individual. Jesus loves me as an individual. His death certainly includes me as an individual. But he did not die so that one tongue and one knee could bow and tongue could fess at the end of the ages. Christ wants my friendship, but he wants all of our friendship. He doesn't just want our friendship with him. He wants our friendship with each other. Christ came for peace on earth. Not peace in heaven. I mean, peace in heaven too, but not just that. Peace on earth. Friendship here, souls together. Jesus is not the friend who would invite you over, but find another friend and then tell you to go home. Jesus does not grow dissatisfied with you or tired of you. Yet we do that with one another sometimes. But Jesus paves the way for us to have friendship with one another. He does this by leaving us an example to follow and empowering us in that example. You know, one scholar writes, the work of the community is the love that Christ displayed by taking the very nature of a servant. And only a common commitment of all in that community to love as Christ loves will restore unity to the divided community. You know, how are we to do this? We've got to participate in the life of Christ. How are we to experience the love of Christ? By participation in the life of Christ. Christ set the example for us of being one mind, life together, souls together. Who did he do this with? With God the Father. Jesus Christ was one soul with God. That is why he did not use his godness to his own advantage. That is why he did not think equality with God was something to be grasped. That is why Christ did not bring armies from heaven to defeat Rome. That is why Christ did not convince the Pharisees of following him or force them in any way. That is why Christ did not force any knee to bow or tongue confess that he was Lord. Why did Christ not do that? Because he cried out to the Father, not my will be done, but yours. Not my will, but yours be done. He prayed the prayer 
that all of us ought to learn in the depths of our souls so that we can be souls together. You know, I've shared this before, but I don't think we can pray that prayer enough. We ought to memorize it and pray it every day for us to be true friends with one another. For us to be true friends with one another, despite our differences, despite our bitterness or hurt, despite our sin, we must surrender our will to the will of others for the sake of Jesus. I'll say that again. We must surrender our will to the will of others for the sake of Jesus. I believe that's what this text is calling me to. Because in the power of Christ and through the imitation of Christ, we are able to count others as more significant than ourselves. And we're able to actually count others as more significant than ourselves and not become crippled with insecurity or anxiety or loneliness. We will not be terrified that we won't be taken care of or that this friendship is not reciprocal or that that person doesn't care about us or that we're not good enough or that we're going to be leaved, uh, left and ashamed and sent home walking a mile and a half, which isn't that far, but as a nine-year-old, maybe it was. You know, we won't be ashamed of those things because we're souls together with Christ. If you notice in verse 6, I'll read it again. In verse 6, or sorry, verse 5, have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. How do we have this mind? Why is this possible? Because it's ours in Christ Jesus, and we share in Christ together as one soul. You know, the crazy thing, though, is that communities like this don't really exist very much on earth anymore. Friendships like this in America don't really exist much anymore. But I believe that I can be a friend like this through the power of Jesus. I believe I can be a father like this through the power of Jesus. But not even just Jesus' power. The power I get through Jesus united me with all of you guys. I think I can be a friend and a father like this only because of you guys and Jesus. The funny thing is, if it was just me and Jesus, I wouldn't have any examples right here to look at friendship with. I wouldn't have anybody showing me mercy on the day-to-day -day level, in the flesh. I'd have God's mercy in prayer, but not in the flesh. I wouldn't have examples of amazing father figures to follow. I wouldn't have examples of amazing husbands to follow. I need you guys. I need to be one soul with you guys. We need each other. And since we share in one soul through Christ, we can share in his power and the power of one another. We can truly be one soul together. I believe the same that's possible for me is possible for each of you. And the thing is, we get to see glimpses of this lived out in one another. We talk about souls together, and I think about the Gaines family, right? Cliff and, Cliff and Hazel up here worshiping together. I, I assume every Sunday up here, leading us in worship with one voice, one soul. Right? I think about the teens over there, serving every week, right? humbling themselves, going behind the stage, right? and making this worship as we worship with one soul together possible. Like, it's amazing. I think about the fathers and mothers in you guys who put yourselves last and say, hey, I'm not going to I'm not going to think about my own interests first. I'm going to serve my child. And I get to see that. I get to see Greg holding Henry in the back. Be like, man, I can't wait to be that. I have examples to follow. Why? Because we're one soul together. And we see these things. And then we strive to live them out in community. I have two practices to assist us in that this week that I want to invite you guys into. The first practice is practice the discipline of honoring others this week. Practice the discipline of honoring others this week. Commit yourself to taking every opportunity to honor, encourage, and praise your brothers and sisters this week. Just take every opportunity to do that. And see that if, in repeating that over and over again, see if you don't start thinking about their interests before your own. Just try it. The second practice I want to invite you guys into is practice the discipline of surrender. Surrendering your will to the will of others for the sake of Jesus. You can see this exemplified in things as small 
as surrendering your will to what movie to watch. You know, if you're ever in a group, Melina said I should share this. If you're ever in a group with more than two people, you know how hard it is to choose a movie that everybody's happy with? It's like as hard as raising Jesus from the dead, right? It's only possible through the Spirit of God. And so in so doing, let us be those who surrender our will to the will of others when we choose movies. Let us be those who surrender our will to the will of others when our spouse is cooking dinner and we don't necessarily like what they're cooking. Let us surrender our will to the will of others when we have to stay up to serve our kids or, or, or you know, whatever, whatever it might be with your family. When your teenagers are getting on your nerves. I know, I know you, Xavier. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> no, but, but think about others first. And then submit your will to theirs. And trust that the Father is uniting your souls when you do it. Yeah, as verse 11 concludes, we're reminded of what it is like to be souls together in full accord and perfect harmony. Now, this is precisely what it will be like when Jesus finally returns, as every tongue confesses that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. All of creation, all of us, all of the peoples on earth are praising God with one voice, one soul, in perfect harmony. This is souls together. Let it be so here in Roanoke and in the NRV. Amen. Thank you, guys. With that, we'll rise for one final song.